Hello. Hi there. How are you this evening? I am fine. Good. How about you? Doing great. Is the weather kicking up up there yet, or? Um, I had I hadn't noticed. Okay. Well, it's not. <laughs> Is it supposed to storm? Yeah, and then a, well, let's say a cold front, a cool front is supposed to come through tonight. We'll see. Yeah, um, sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong. That's for sure. Although I wouldn't mind cooler weather. I wouldn't either. I always play with the lights. Yeah, it might be too bright. Don't know. Shining. Yeah, a little Kevin. bit, maybe. Yeah. I think maybe I'll turn it back down. Well, it seems like I'm still brighter on one side than the other. Well, for now, I think that's as, <laughs> as good we as it can gets. See you. That's what counts. <laughs> Some might, some might say that doesn't count for much. Well, <laughs> I'm sure you have close friends that say that. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Bob. Hi, Molly. Good evening. Hello. Hello. My finger was a little slow moving the cursor. <laughs> no problem. I was just talking about how it, it was really bright, shining off my face, and I tried to dim it, but I, it's still kind of shiny. So I, I'm going to have to figure out how to uh, how to work this. Get that powder out. Oh, there, there you go. <laughs> Yeah, my uh, my makeup artist is uh, is off for the evening. Earlier, Danny was having trouble getting in, so I don't know if he's still having trouble or not. Well, let me see. Where did I put my Bible? It would be really good if I had it. We're going to be in Luke chapters 21 and 22 tonight. We're getting down toward the end of the... Uh, Toward the end of the account, and there's just some real, some real challenging and some real great things that are that are left for us. Uh, let's uh, let's begin with a prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for this time to study, to be uh, to be together uh, for this study, and and to. Uh, have a chance to just saturate ourselves with the with the life of Jesus and with His teachings, and we ask that you would uh, use these to uh, change our hearts and revolutionize our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, Luke twenty one and twenty two. I'm going to begin actually by reading the last few verses of um, chapter 20, 
starting with verse 45. And in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers, they will receive the greater condemnation. Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering, into the offering box. And he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. I, I link these together because I think, um, I, I think that's what Luke had in mind. There is a kind of a contrast here between the self aggrandizing anger uh, whatever um, of the of the scribes they're promoting themselves it's all about self the the, the robes um, the robes are meant to make them look good they love these special greetings as people who are are important in the marketplace. They also are marked off as being important by having the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at feasts. And yet there's, there's a terrible corruption at the heart of many of them. They, uh, they devour, he says, widows' houses and for, for a pretense make long prayers. So outwardly, that they want to be honored and they want to look as if they are deeply religious people, but inwardly they are, um, they're somewhere else altogether. They're about self and not about honoring God. And that shows itself in um, what I take to be corrupt practices of cheating widows out of their houses. And, um, and, and then for a pretense, making long prayers. And he says they will be condemned. And then he immediately, we're told, looks up and he sees the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. And he sees a poor widow come and put two small coins, two small copper coins. These coins, by the way, were worth, were the smallest coins in circulation in Jesus' day. These two coins were worth a fraction of a cent. So it wasn't the amount that the, that the widow was putting in. It was, the, um, it was the total, it was the fact that it was everything she had. It wasn't because it was such a great amount, the rich had put in much more and he said, they do it out of their abundance and uh, we might suppose that a lot of them probably did it with a flourish to look good, but out of their abundance, they, they, they could give plenty because they had plenty to give. This woman gave all that she had. And um, that, that was, that's just a tremendous example of um, unselfish generosity, giving your very best to God. Then starting with verse five and going down through almost to the end of the chapter, we have a, a discourse. The last major discourse of Jesus in, in the gospel of Luke. And um, it finds parallels in Matthew and Mark in Matthew 24 and in Mark 13. Mark 13 in particular is sometimes called the little apocalypse. The, the language in these three parallel sermons is language of, that's, that's similar, it's called the little apocalypse because the language is similar to what you would expect in the book of Revelation. 
but this is a parallel. But but Luke, remember Luke is writing for a Gentile audience, and he's got certain themes that are important, and so he, while the the three are parallel, they're not they're not duplicates of each other because each of them have a different audience and a different purpose in mind. But uh, this discourse tells us a lot about the kingdom of God and, um, and the end of the world. But it is also quite challenging and quite, uh, it can be quite confusing. But I'll try to uh, help make sense of it this evening. Starting with verse 5. And while some were speaking of the temple, how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings, he said, as for these things that you see, the days will come when there will be, when there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Just a, just a word about that. They're standing at the temple. The temple was a magnificent building. By today, even by today's standards, it would be huge, much bigger than any religious, uh, almost any religious buildings in the world. I mean, it was just, it was a huge building. Um, it was made of white stone. This is, now we're talking about Herod's temple, uh, so-called. It was made out of white stone and was said to uh, shine in the sun. It had a dome. That was made out of gold. It had it had um, it had columns, each one made of one huge stone. It was a big, magnificent building. The rabbis, who had no great love for Herod the Great, said, "You haven't seen anything beautiful unless you've seen Herod's temple." And so, um, it was a magnificent building, and it impressed and it's the heart of judaism okay and it impressed the disciples and and then jesus says that makes the startling statement you see this magnificent building these huge stones all this i'm telling you that the days will come when there's not going to be one stone left on another here they're all going to be thrown down then that it says they and that would be his disciples said teacher when, and notice that there are two questions here. When will these things be? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? So notice when and what. When will these things be? When, when, when's this going to happen? This throwing down of these stones. And what will be the sign that they, they are about to take place? I think in the disciples' minds, they couldn't imagine this happening unless it was the end of the world. But, but that, I think that's the context of their, of their question. Uh, but two questions. When's it going to happen? And what will be the sign that it's going to happen? Jesus begins to address this, and I think he gives insight into the entire discourse in, in the first two verses of his discussion verses eight and nine and he said see that you are not led astray for many will come in my name saying i am he and the time is at hand do not go after them and when you hear of wars and tumults do not be terrified for these things must take place must first take place but the end will not be at once. Okay, notice he, 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 he starts out by saying two things. See that you are not led astray. And then he gives illustrations of that. And then, and when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be afraid or do not be terrified. So do not be led astray and do not be terrified. Or another way to put it is, don't be deceived. Don't be afraid. He's about to speak of some things where uh, during a period of time when they could be deceived and also a period of time in which they could easily be terrified by, by what's going on. 
So he addresses, the, he expands on the first about not being led astray by saying, there are people who are going to come in my name, and I take my name to be Messiah, Christ. Because there are some who are going to say, I am he. So they haven't come in the name of Jesus, but they have come in the name of Messiah. I am the Messiah, in other words. The time is at hand. Uh, the time of the Messiah is here. And so whether they're actually claiming to be the Messiah or whether it's a messianic revolt, where the Messiah, they don't conceive that the Messiah is yet present, it doesn't matter. This will be deception. This is not the when or the what. And when you hear wars and tumults, do not be afraid, for these must first take place, but the end is not at once. They're looking for something that's going to happen immediately. Jesus has come into Jerusalem. His disciples are very excited about it. The crowds, he's got a large following uh, in the crowds. They're, they've been celebrating his coming into, the, in, into Jerusalem. Uh, all the evidence of the Gospels would say that these people are ready to revolt, and they see Jesus as their man. He's the Messiah, and he's come to, to lead this revolt against the Romans. But, but he's saying very plainly in this, it's not happening. Not happening now. And although he hasn't said it yet, it's going to be, and it's not happening the way you think either. Uh, then picking up to verse 10, then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places, famines and pestilences. And there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before this, but before all this, we'll, we'll just hold it there for a second. Notice he's spoken of nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom. He talks about earthquakes in various places and in various places, famines and pestilence. Um, and there will be terrors and great signs in the heaven, from heaven. Notice, I want you to notice that this discourse is not in chronological order. These are mentioned first, but these aren't the first things that are going to happen because in verse 12, he says, but before all this, so then he's going to speak of something that's going to happen before all of that nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom and so on. And, and, um, and you've got to really think clearly about when will this nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom and the, uh, and the earthquakes and all this other, when, when's this going to take place? What I would contend is, I mean, think about this. Sometimes people have interpreted this as stuff that's showing the end of, uh, that the end of the world's just around the corner. Problem is, all this stuff's been going on for the last 2,000 years. Um, when have we not had a time when you had kingdom against kingdom, nation against nation, earthquakes, famines, pestilence, terrors, great signs from, the he from heaven, which isn't clear what that is exactly. But, but the natural phenomenon here, at least, have been going on for the last 2,000 years. So this isn't some kind of special sign at the very end, but it is a sign that, that, well, Jesus said, this is going to be going on. Then, as I've already mentioned, verse 12, but before all this, but before all those things take place, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my namesake. And, and this will be your opportunity to bear witness. Settle it before in your minds, not to meditate before how to answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which none of you, your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you will, will be put to death. You will be hated by all for my namesake. 
but not a hair on your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. Okay, before all this 2,000 years of nation against nation, earthquake and famine, uh, there's going to be the experience of the early church and 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 he zeroes in. I think he's he is specifically talking to the twelve. It is the experience of the early church in general, but but I think the twelve. We need to keep them in mind as we as we read this. Um, he says they're going to lay hands on you. They're going to persecute you. They're going to deliver you up. Notice both Jews and Gentiles. Jews are going to deliver you up to synagogues. Gentiles are going to deliver deliver you up to prisons. You will be brought before kings and governors, that would be Gentiles, for my name's sake. And by the way, the prisons could also be Jewish, but anyway, you have Jewish and Gentile both going on here. And they're going to be persecuted. And he's going to have more to say about this, but they're going to be persecuted because of him. Uh, but this persecution, while harsh, is an opportunity. Verse 13, this will be your opportunity to bear witness. Persecution, while it's hard, is, is, has always been time for the people of God to speak up and to bear witness to their faith, their enduring faith in the midst of the, in the, midst of the persecution, not in spite of the, not, well, not, because the persecution is held away by God, but in the midst of the persecution, witness uh, of the church is always wrung out. Settle it before in your minds, not to meditate before on how to answer. I, I believe this is specifically having to do with the apostles. It may be beyond that, but he's saying that they're not going to, they're going to be persecuted. So this isn't the same thing as, um, Sunday morning, preacher getting up in the pulpit and preaching in relative safety. I mean, yeah, you could have an active shooter that comes in or something, but but uh, we're used to pretty calm Sunday mornings. And uh, this is speaking of people who are being persecuted and hauled in before before their enemies. And they're not going to have a lot of time to think think it all through. And he says, don't meditate on it. And don't. And the implication is, don't worry about it. I will give you what you need to say. And your adversaries are not going to be able to withstand or contradict what you say. He, he further describes the persecution, I believe, when he says, you'll be delivered up even by parents, brothers, relatives, friends. So even even closest ties of family and friendship will be broken over, over the name of Jesus, whether for him or against him. Uh, he says you'll be hated. Well, he says some of you will be put to death. And he says you'll be hated because of my namesake. And that's the specific thing. It's not just hated for no reason. It's because of him and that we bear his name. And then he says something that um, seems odd, but if you think about it, it'll come clear. But not a hair on your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. But he's just said some of you are going to be put to death. What? How can some of us be put to death and at the same time be, be told that not a hair on our heads will perish and that by endurance we'll gain our lives? I believe that there's no contradiction there. I, but I believe it's talking about two different things. Some of them are going to be put to death physically. And we know in the early church that happened. They were persecuted, put to death. But in the midst of the physical death, there's no spiritual death. And I believe that when he says, not a head on, uh, or not a hair on your head will perish, and that by your endurance, you'll gain your lives. I think he's talking about eternal life and eternal salvation. So their salvation will be secure, even though their bodies may be killed. Then he moves from these general signs that are going to take place for 2,000 years, these general characteristics of the period, trouble, 
there's trouble. Um, and and from the experience of the early church of persecution, he now he now moves on to two stages, I believe, two other stages of the end of the world. But these are have been traditionally very confusing to people because that one seems to blend into another, but that's on purpose. I think I've used this illustration before, but I think I think I don't know of a better way to illustrate it. In the prophetic imagination, you see this in the Old Testament and you see it reflected in, in Jesus. The perspective is we're seeing, we're seeing events, a lot of events. They're not necessarily chronological as we've already seen, but we're seeing these events that are um, taking place in the future. As we look at them, they look as if one is happening immediately after the other. But in the prophets, we find over and over again, they're not happening one after the other, not immediately. There's sometimes a very long period between them. And, and the illustration I like to use is of a mountain range. If you are at a distance and you're looking at the mountain range, it looks as if those mountains are one right on top of the other. But as you get closer, maybe you're on the first mountain, you see that the second one is miles and miles away. And I think, I think the prophetic uh, experience, the prophetic perspective is something like that. Events may look like they're happening one right after the other, when one right after the other can be a thousand years, two thousand years. Um, so notice what he says next, starting in verse 20. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let those who are inside the city depart and let those and let not those who are out in the country enter it. For these are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, for there will be a great distress upon the earth and wrath against this people and they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled then you'll notice in 25 it says and there will be signs in heaven and or in 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 the sun and moon and so on and, and when you look at that, it's obvious that we're talking about something a little different. So let's just start with Jerusalem. In um, Matthew and in Mark, they say when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it shouldn't be, instead of saying that, Luke says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies. That's the abomination of desolation of Matthew and of Mark. Luke, for his Gentile audience, defines the term, describes it very, very, uh, very carefully. And notice in, in his description here, he's not talking about the end of the world. He's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you will know that its desolation is near. And he gives instructions to the people of God, how they're to react. Let those who are in Judea, that's the area around Jerusalem, flee to the mountains. Let those who are inside the city depart, get out of there now, when you see the armies coming. Let those who are out in the countryside not enter, not enter Jerusalem. For these are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. When you, when you uh, read the history of the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans, um, depending on your perspective, but it, it, the, the story is uh, a story of lots of things, but we can see it as a, his, a, a heroic struggle. But the thing is, and Jesus is making this point, this destruction of Jerusalem was um, verse 22 
God's vengeance on a disobedient, willful, evil people. They had departed from God. If they accepted the Messiah, then they would be running, then they wouldn't be in Jerusalem and the Romans wouldn't surround it and destroy it. But it's the very fact that they're in rebellion to God that, uh, that the city will be destroyed and the people in it will, will die. And this is all very descriptive. The revolt started in 66 AD. It spread throughout Judea and Galilee. The Romans came in first into Galilee and took all the strongholds, the Jewish strongholds in Galilee. Then they came into Judea and they went around taking all the strongholds in Judea. And finally, uh, there was the big prize and that was Jerusalem itself, a big, strong city high walls, um, well, well protected as far as, uh, as far as walls and the way the whole thing was made. The Romans, four legions of Roman soldiers came in from three directions. Two were from the northwest, one from the southwest, and one from the east. And um, they came and they surrounded Jerusalem. At first, it was still possible to leave. But eventually, the Romans built a wall around the walls of Jerusalem. And at that point, nobody, nobody, was, nobody left. It didn't matter whether you were just trying to save yourself, whether you were trying to escape to fight another day. It didn't matter. Anybody leaving Jerusalem was put to death. So before that happens, Jesus is in instructed his disciples to run for the hills if if they're not in the city they're not to go in if they're in the city they're to get out alas for women and he specifically speaks of women who are pregnant or who have infants can you imagine being in the besieged city they had plenty of water but they didn't have plenty of food and the romans uh, starved them out they did attack, and, and eventually, little by little, they came through the walls. But but before that, before that was complete, people inside the city were starving. The um, it was known that people ate their own infants. That if you had somebody in the city who was who was too fat. They would kill them because they had to be hoarding food. They could, how could they not be initiated like everybody else? And yet they kept making sacrifices until the very end when they ran out of even sacrificial animals, which they had protected up to that point. But this all came upon them, God's wrath, because they had rejected the Messiah. Uh, the, he speaks of how they're going to fall up by the sword. They did. And the ones who didn't fall by the sword when they captured the city were led away as captives. Some of them uh, were sold as slaves. Some were taken to Jerusalem or to Rome, rather, uh, for the triumphal pr procession of the army returning to Roman victory. Um, they were scattered among the nations. He sp speaks of how they would be, Jerusalem would be trampled by underfoot by the Gentiles, Romans, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. It had been the times of Israel until Israel rejected the Messiah, and then it became the time of the Gentiles. And those times had to be fulfilled. Then we pick up. And there will be signs in, in sun and moon and stars and on the earth, distress uh, of the nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves, people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in, in, in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to take place, straighten up, raise, raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. It's obvious, I think, 
it is obvious that we're talking about something different here. Before it's Jerusalem, Jerusalem surrounded by armies, Roman armies, uh, bottled up, besieged, destroyed. But then he speaks of natural wonders. Now these may be literal or they may be symbolic. If you go back to the Old Testament, there, uh, this, this kind of language is often used in, symbolically in the Old Testament of some great cataclysmic uh, uh, scenario, some great uh, powerful move, movement of God. Um, but the end, but but we're talking about a, a tremendous, um, I believe, end of the world that nobody can miss. And people are going to be shaken. They're going to be afraid. Uh, the Son of Man comes with the cloud, with power and great glory, his second coming. Uh, and uh, while that will be terrifying, remember he told them, don't be terrified. Don't be terrified of persecution. Don't be terrified when the armies surround Jerusalem. And don't be terrified at the second coming. Because at the second coming, while it will be terrible, for dreadful for the people who are in rebellion to God, it will be the greatest day. It'll be the greatest day that we've ever had on earth for the people of God, because you know that your redemption is drawing near. Then he goes on to tell them a parable, a parable having to do with tree. And he says, um, when it comes out in leaf leaves, you know that the summer is near. And, and he says, when, when, when these things happen, when these things happen to Jerusalem, <coughs> for instance, you will know that the kingdom of God is near. Before we have talked about how the kingdom of God, as, it's, as Jesus presents it, both is present and future. It's the kingdom that's now here, but it's also the kingdom that's not here yet. And that's a way of saying, the kingdom came in stages. It came with Jesus. It comes at a great, uh, another stage when, when he's raised from the dead. And at the end of the world will be the final stage uh, in which the kingdom will be handed over uh, to the Heavenly Father. Then something that's been highly debated, verse 32, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all this, all, all has taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So what does that mean? I mean, what this generation will not pass away until all this takes place. Well, they were still, most of them would have still been alive when Jerusalem fell. But, they, but, but the second coming hasn't happened yet. So what's it talking about? Now, this is debated in different ways. Uh, one 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 take on it has been that this generation refers specifically to the destruction of Jerusalem and not to the end of the world. That's possible. But I think there's a better explanation. And that is, if you go back through Luke, and I'd encourage you to do that, get a, get a good concordance and look up the phrase, this generation in Luke. And you'll find that almost always, if not always, in context, throughout Luke, it's a negative term. We wouldn't be far from the mark if we translated it this evil generation. Over and over again, this generation is not a positive term, and it's not a term that's simply describing the, the, the present state of a group of people. So I believe rather than, rather than describing a time it's describing a mindset and a kind of people. And I think what Jesus is saying is, truly I say to you, evil people, the evil generation of people who have lived and died in rebellion to God will not have passed away when the end comes. Not, not when Jerusalem is destroyed and not when the second coming takes place. Anyway, that's, that, that is the explanation that makes the most sense to me, given the way this generation is used throughout Luke. Um, um, yes. Yeah. I, 
I guess I could listen to that again on YouTube, but would you say that once more after you said it doesn't describe a time, but a mindset? What did you say next? What I was saying is it doesn't, it's not describing a time period, this right. generation, but a mindset. Yes. This generation is this, again, I think we wouldn't be far from the mark to translate it, this evil generation. Okay. And I'm saying that's the way, if you go back through Luke, you'll find almost always, if not always, that's the way it's used. Mm -hmm. And so it would be very strange if it wasn't used that way here to me, at least. And it, and it explains it. It says we're not talking about it, the, 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 the people who are now alive are still going to be alive at the second coming. What it's saying is the same kind of rebellious spirit that we see now and we saw in the past, past, present, and future is still going to be there at the second coming. Did that make it clearer or muddier? Yes, no, that's good. Okay, that's good. good. As I said, that it, it, it's, it has been traditionally a difficult verse. That's what makes most sense to me. Jim? Uh, there, there are a lot of explanations out there, but that, that's the one that makes the most sense to me. Yeah. Well, I, I would agree and disagree. <laughs> I would say that the generation is, and uh, lots of commentators take this, so I don't think we ought to press it, but this generation refers to that 40 years, because if Jesus was crucified in 30, essentially, and then the destruction of Jerusalem occurred in 70, and a generation generally was regarded as 40 years, I think it makes uh, a possible interpretation there. Uh, as well, well as I had mentioned that that interpretation is the interpretation that says this generation is referring specifically to the destruction of Jerusalem and not to the end of the world. But it right. looks like it looks to me, it looks like it's referring to both. I think so. I, I'm inclined to go with that because of Isaiah 13 and all those other apocalyptic uh, references in the Old Testament to those symbol that symbolism i think that what luke is doing here is drawing the two things together in a context that said uh the jews believed that jerusalem could never be destroyed it was never going to be destroyed the messiah was going to come back and restore, restore that physical kingdom and luke is saying something so phenomenal that he i think he really does a masterful job of mixing the images it's yeah. just fantastic it is yeah. Wow. It gives me goosebumps, man. <laughs> well, and you know, it, two, and I mentioned this, but I, I, I want to em emphasize it. This was God's judgment on Jerusalem by the hand of the Romans. In the same way that God judged uh, ancient Israel by the hand of the, uh, by the Babylonians, when they, when they battered down the walls of Jerusalem and, and destroyed Solomon's temple. And um, you can see videos and things that talk about the siege of Jerusalem, and you, you watch those, and they can come off as heroic. And they were in a sense, but this is a heroism of people who were in rebellion to God and, and because they had rejected the Messiah. And this was the, this was the end result of it. And um, I think we need to keep that in mind as, uh, as we read this. This isn't just the bad Romans destroying good Jews. No, the, the Romans were the, the hand of, I believe they were, they were the instrument of God's wrath against the people who had rebelled. And that's why when you go back through Luke and see Jesus weeping over Jerusalem, it's because this destruction is coming and it is, it's preventable. All they had to do was accept the Messiah. All, okay. All they had to do was accept the Messiah and they didn't. Anyway, good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that background, Kirk. Okay. Then he sums up by saying, but watch, verse 34, but watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down 
with dissipation and drunkenness and the cares of this life, and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. But stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Okay, he, he ends with application. You know, a lot of people have treated Luke 21, Mark 13, Matthew 24 as the better than science, science, science fiction, rather, the better than science fiction approach to the end of the world, okay? Throw in the book of Revelation there too. And, um, and sometimes in the midst of that, it's easy to lose perspective on practical application. This isn't just a mind thing about what's the, what's the end of the world, what's the destruction of Jerusalem and the end of the world going to be like. But Jesus gives a very practical uh, application. Watch yourselves. Don't be weighed down by evil, by the cares of the world, so that this day, whether it's the destruction of Jerusalem or specifically, I think the emphasis is more the end of the world, so that it, it comes on you suddenly like a trap. Um, for it will be upon uh, all who dwell on earth. See, that's what makes me think that we're talking about specifically the second coming. But stay awake. Pray that you may have strength to escape these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. So we, we need to be awake, to, to watch, to be awake, to be praying, to, to have ourselves spiritually prepared so that if, if Jesus comes anytime, to, including tonight, that we'll be ready for him. Uh, then uh, the chapter ends with Jesus teaching in the temple during the day and going out to lodge on the Mount of Olives at night. And, and that's, it's a little note, but it's important. Then in chapter 22, we have the Feast of Unleavened Bread it draws near that's called the Passover. Originally, the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were actually two different feasts. The Passover was one day. And then it was followed by the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was seven days. But by the time of Jesus, those were combined. Uh, so they just, and you can see how they would be. One just leads right in, right into the other. Um, the, and during this period, we have the chief priests and the scribes. They're seeking to put Jesus to death, but they're afraid of the people. I mean, the, these people are the ones that just celebrated Jesus coming into the city. And they're afraid of this crowd and their reaction. Will these people take up arms? Will they, I mean, if we try to kill or capture Jesus, arrest him, are they going to come and kill us? Are they going to riot in the streets and bring the wrath of the Romans down? What, we don't know. So they're afraid of them and not, uh, and they, they want to do away with Jesus, but they don't know how to do it. And then Satan gives them their way. Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was of the number of the 12. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and the officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. Okay, there's a lot here. Judas is one of the 12. He, um, we're told Satan entered him. So Satan is the master puppeteer and he is influencing Judas. Judas still has his choice. This doesn't take away Judas's choice. Satan didn't make Judas do what he did. But he certainly did encourage it, and, and Judas was in, lo in league with Satan when he did what he did. He went to the chief priests and the officers. These would be the 
basically the temple police um, and, and talked to them about how he might betray him and, and they agreed to give him money. My person, none of the gospel accounts say specifically why Judas betrayed Jesus. My best estimate is that it's as easy to explain as greed. The accounts say that he was paid for what he did. We know that he, we know from John that he was a thief, that while he had, was in charge of the money, he had his hand he had his hand in the money bag, taking stuff for himself. And so I just think it was greed. It could have been something else, but that's the one, again, I'll say, that makes the most sense to me. But uh, th they agree to give him money. He's going to find an opportunity to, to, uh, to uh, betray Jesus. Um, in the absence of a crowd, there's the key. Remember, they're afraid of the crowd. So Jesus celebrates the Passover or Feast of Unleavened Bread. On the day when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, he sends Peter and John, two of his most trusted disciples, to prepare for the Passover. They're to go into town. They will see a man with a uh, carrying a water, a water pot, a water jar. They're to, uh, they're to say, where is the guest room? Uh, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples, and he'll show you a large room. Now, this idea of the man carrying the water pot w w definitely was a sign. You might say, well, how would they know that that was the guy? Well, they would know it because carrying water jars was women's work. For a man to be carrying a water jar was unusual. He would stand out. Um, now, what was going on here? Did, had Jesus did Jesus know this guy and know the one who owned the upper room and he worked on this all ahead of time, perhaps? But my personal belief is that this is miraculous. That, um, that this unusual sign of the man carrying the water jar and, and all they have to do is ask him and ask the owner of the place about the room and they just open everything up. I, I believe that this is uh, probably showing the miraculous knowledge and power of Jesus. Um, so then he has, he has the Lord's Supper, what we call the Lord's Supper, the Passover meal with his disciples. Luke is a little different in that he, uh, Luke reflects the fact that during the Passover, there were four cups. Those of us who grew up in the church and grew up hearing about the Lord's Supper, no one cup. <laughs> okay, there's the You've got bread and you've got the cup. Um, but during the Passover, there were actually four cups. And Luke speaks of a cup, um, verse 17, and he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. From now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of, come, kingdom of God comes. That, that is probably... It might be cup number one, but it's probably cup number two. Then he takes bread. Okay, where am I? Verse 19. Then he takes bread and, and he gives thanks. He breaks it. He gives it to, oh, yeah. Let me say one other thing. He, uh, before this, he says, for I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. I believe this is this idea of stages, and he's going to celebrate the Passover with them, and he's going to institute the Lord's Supper, and, he, and he's not going to be doing this physically again until the kingdom of God comes. Uh, that would be either after the resurrection or I think probably more likely at, at the second coming when you have the messianic banquet that is is referred to throughout uh scripture the great celebration of the people of god at the end of the world um but then he takes the bread he gives thanks he breaks it he gives it to them and in words that are familiar to most of us this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me so the bread represents his body 
they don't understand it yet, but this is the body that's going to be given up on the cross for them. And they're to do this to remember, to remember who he is and what he'd done. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten saying, see, here's another one of the cups. So actually two of the cups are mentioned by Luke. And this, this second cup that's mentioned here is the one that institutes the Lord's Supper. This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. He's creating a new covenant, a new agreement with the new Israel, the new people of God. And, and, and as covenants are to be ratified by in blood, so he is going to ratify this covenant by his own blood. And behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to the man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them would be he who, who was going to do this. By the way, the, I mean, the indication here is that Judas was right there through the inauguration or of the Lord's Supper, the institution of the Lord's Supper. I believe in John 13, where Jesus washes their feet, we have no reason to believe he didn't wash Judas's feet. And then Judas here was for the inst instituting of the Lord's Supper. And I believe both of these were a way of, in a sense, one last appeal to Judas. And it's especially powerful when he lets Judas know that he knows. He knows he's going to be betrayed, and he even knows who's going to do it. And Judas still goes out and does what he does. Um, then there's a dispute. We've seen this. In, we see this in other places. They're arguing about which one of them is the greatest. <sighs> The 12 were great at one-upsmanship. I am smarter, or I'm more talented, or I'm more dedicated, or whatever, uh, than you are. And uh, Jesus says, you're just acting like a bunch of Gentiles, which is, for Jewish guys, you know, that's a real insult. The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who have authority over them call them benefactors. But it's not to be that way among you. He said, the greatest of you is to be as the youngest and the leader, the one who serves. By the way, in their society, we've seen it. We see it in other places. Children were not, it was not a child-centered uh, culture. Children were important chiefly because they carried on, they carried on the family name, but, but otherwise, you know, the kid. Uh, their emphasis was more on um, adulthood and and the elderly were revered. Um, our society is not like that, unfortunately, and we're poorer for it. But um, he says the the greatest is going to be as the youngest. And the leader is going to be the one who serves. Real leadership comes in service, not in lording it over people and demanding things. For who is greater, the one who reclines at table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? That's the way it normally is. But I am among you as one who serves. Jesus' rightful place, it would appear, would be to be served, not to serve, but he, but he serves. Um, you are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assign to you, as my father assigned to me, a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in the kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. 
notice this, you may eat and drink at my table in, in the kingdom. I think that's a reference to the that Messianic banquet I talked about. And I believe that the Lord's Supper actually anticipates that final celebration. And we need to keep that in mind. The Lord's Supper does a lot of things. I mean, it is a remembrance. It's a reliving. It's an anticipation of uh, uh, we do it until he comes. Um, but I believe also that it anticipates that great celebration at the end of the world when the people of God all gather in this great banquet. Then Jesus foretells Peter's denial. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you. Satan wants Peter, and not just Peter, but all the others. He, and because you, in verse 31, the you there twice is plural. Uh, so he's speaking to Peter, but, but when he says you all, He's showing that, that, that they're all in this. Uh, it's singular after as he concentrates on Peter, but here it's plural. Um, he wants to sift them like, Satan wants to sift them like wheat. He wants to tempt them and destroy them. And Jesus says, and I love this, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Are they, he already knows that they're, they're going to run away. Peter's going to deny him, but ultimately he's prayed that their, ultimately their faith will not fail. And I think that's important for us. Do we blow it sometimes? Do we do the wrong thing? Do we sometimes find ourselves saying, I will never do that. I'll never say that again. And then we find ourselves doing it. It's not whether we, fail in that sense but whether we give up there's the ultimate failure is when we just stop trying to be the people that god's made us to be um and he says to peter when you have turned again strengthen your brothers so he looks beyond uh, peter's denial and to to when peter will will be the strength of the twelve or, and will strengthen the 12. But Peter, see, doesn't believe any of this. I'm ready to go with you both to prison and death. And I believe he was. I believe that was absolutely sincere. We, we know in the garden, he's the one that has the sword and whacks off the servant's ear. He's ready to fight. And he was ready to fight until Jesus deflated him. He was a brave man, manly man. But once he was deflated, well, and he was, but he was living by his own strength and not the strength of God. And once he's deflated, he's gone. So Jesus predicts that he's going to, that he's going to deny Jesus uh, three times. He's going to say he, he doesn't know him before the cock crows. And then Jesus says something that's kind of uh, enigmatic. But I believe it is, I believe he's being ironic uh, because he, before he had sent them out in chapter nine, he sent out the 12. In chapter 10, he sent out the 72. He said, uh, when I sent you out, there was no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, nothing extra. Did you lack anything? No, we didn't. But now let me tell you, and I, here's the, I think the unspoken, but I think this is what he's getting at. Now let me tell you, there's trouble. And you've got to be prepared for the spiritual fight. <clears throat> so you need to take a money bag. You need to take a knapsack. If you don't have a sword, <clears throat> sell your cloak and buy one. But I don't believe that, I don't believe he's meaning that literally. They take it literally. But I think he means to say, you're going to be in a fight. And remember in chapter 21, he talked about the fight. They're going to be persecuted and hated. Um, again, that's at least that's the way I take it. 
And he says the scripture must be fulfilled and he was numbered among the transgressors. That's from Isaiah 53. That's going to be fulfilled. Everything in Isaiah 53 about the suffering servant. And they showing that they don't understand what he's talking about. Say, Lord, we have two swords. And he said, it's enough. Now, if he literally meant that they needed to have swords, then that saying about it is enough to have two is patently ridiculous. They're thinking in terms of a revolution. 12 guys with two swords doesn't make much of a revolution. Okay. It, I, I think there was probably sadness in his voice. It's enough. Um, as he says that. Then they go out to the Mount of Olives. By the way, I believe that this is calculated. And it shows that Jesus is the one who's in charge even of his own arrest and crucifixion and not Judas or the chief priests or the soldiers. Jim. Why does he keep going to the Mount of Olives when he knows that, that he knows Judas is going to betray him? And he and the chief priests haven't seized him because they don't know where he is. They know where he is when he's out teaching. He's in the temple. And he's surrounded by crowds, the crowds that the chief priests fear. But when he's out at the Mount of Olives, he's at, and, and in Gethsemane, he's at the foot of the Mount of Olives, and he goes there every night. Now, the chief priests don't know this, but Judas does. And Judas takes, takes the mob to the place, to the very place that he knows Jesus, Jesus will be. And I, I, I don't think it's, a stretch to say Jesus knew he was going to be betrayed and he was making it easy because it was part of the plan of God. And he goes out to the Gethsemane and he, and he prays and um, notice he's already mentioned that he's prayed for Peter and the others, uh, but here he prays for himself and what he's about to face on the cross and he prays that the cup will pass from him. In the Old Testament, the cup was sometimes a cup of blessing, but more often than not, it was a cup of, cup of uh, cursing. And it was a cup that uh, very often the cup is used as the wine of God's wrath. Drink it all. Drink the wrath of God. Take it into yourself. And... Um, and I believe that's how that this is being used here. The cup that he wants to pass, there it, it in the end will be a cup of blessing, but it's also a cup of wrath, and he is taking the wrath of God upon himself for us. And while he's facing his trial, hello, yes, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, what I was gonna I was gonna mention this about the uh, the swords. Um, um, uh, could it be that uh, when Jesus was talking to them uh, and, he, and he was saying, now let the one who has no money bag take, who has a money bag take it, and likewise a knapsack, and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. I think that um, uh, it's perhaps he was talking about, uh, he didn't mean it literally, get a knapsack and like nobody can well i can't go out without a knapsack gotta get a knapsack i think he meant it in a sense of uh you got to prepare for the battle that's coming to you sort of thing uh, i don't think that he meant it in the sense of buy a real sword and then when they said uh look lord here are two swords and uh uh perhaps his uh inflection was uh that that's enough come on come on you know like come on you're just not getting it, you know. Uh, I, you understand what I'm saying? Just a different inflection yeah. because we don't have inflection in the text. Um, that's just a thought. No, I, I, I uh, as I understand what you're saying, I would agree with that. Um, I, uh, like you would say that's I mean, enough. Remember, like somebody was talking to you and arguing, you would say, the one who is in authority, that's enough. Like, stop with that. You see, that's what I'm thinking, perhaps. Okay. He could be saying that. He could he could also be saying, 
you know, see, we don't know the inflection. That's the problem. Um, he could be saying, it's enough. To, for, for my purposes, two right, songs is right. enough. It's more than enough. Um, or he could be more emphatic than that. But whatever, he's, he's not telling them literally that two swords is enough to, to start the revolution that they want to start because that's got nothing to do with, with what he's doing. Right. It's like they, they were missing the whole point of what he was saying. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sorry about that. No, no problem. I, I, I like comments and questions, so that's good. Um, an angel comes and strengthens him. I love that, that in verse 43. Um, and, and one of the things I would emphasize is Jesus was facing a trial, and so were his disciples. He prayed. They didn't. And we see the results. He overcomes his trial. They don't. Uh, then, as he's still speaking, Judas comes with this crowd that are ar heavily armed as if Jesus is going to resist them, as if they're going to have a fight on their hands. Maybe they thought there was, or maybe this is just all for a show. He comes, and of all the cynical things, he betrays Jesus with a kiss. The kiss is meant to um, identify which one is Jesus, because apparently the soldiers don't really know, and it'd be dark as well. And and may, and maybe they, you know, maybe a large number of ones in the crowd had never even seen Jesus. But anyway, he betrays him with a kiss. Um, it says, uh, when those who are around saw him, uh, Lord, shall we strike with a sword? And one of them, we know from from elsewhere that it, the, the one who struck was, was Peter. Um, Jesus heals the, the man's ear that's cut off. And um, he ch really chides them for, for coming out as if he's some kind of a robber or a revolutionary then they um, then they take him to be tried and there's a parallel between his trial and in a sense peter's trial peter's trial isn't isn't anything official it's um he comes close he comes to caiaphas's house and there's a fire that the servants have lit, lit outside and he's there warming himself at the fire and three times he's confronted by people who are saying aren't you one of jesus disciples one of them says you're a galilean which um how would they know he was a galilean except by accent it's sort of like you can identify some people by the accent that they have the distinctive accent and the Galileans uh, had an accent that would have been um, distinctive for people in Jerusalem. So three times he's challenged and three times he denies he knows Jesus. And then at that point, the rooster crows and, and Luke is the only one that records this. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Now, we don't know what was going on there. I, I sort of uh, am imagining that Jesus was being moved from one, one part of the property, one part of the house to another part, and that he came outside, which would have been re is reasonable, given the way the houses were built. And that it was at that time that Peter made his third denial and that the rooster crowed and Jesus looks. Now, the men who were, here's, isn't it 53? 
Yeah, 63. Now, the men who were holding Jesus in custody. Oh, yeah, I'll say one other thing. There were two trials by the Jews. The first was informal at the house of um, Annas or Ananias. Um, then the second one was official uh, at the house of Caiaphas. Caiaphas was the high priest, but um, but his his father-in-law um, had been high priest and was the power, the real power. And um, the, the, Luke only records that second trial, which was the official one, because uh, you couldn't have it. You couldn't have it in the middle of the night, which is when the first trial took place, the informal one. And so they had to wait till daybreak. And the assembly of the entire Sanhedrin, which was made up of priests and um, elders, and um, they had to wait that for that to, 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 to give the official verdict. You know, part of what we see is this, as goes on so often in history, uh, this in a sense was just a show trial. They'd already decided the verdict before they were tried him. And um, they brought in witnesses, but they didn't, the witnesses were just there as a fiction. They'd already decided the sentence. They just needed to find the appropriate way to condemn him. But anyway, he's being held by temple soldiers, police, and they beat him. Um, see, he, they haven't even finished the trial yet. I mean, uh, he's not officially been condemned at all, and yet they are, uh, they beat him, they mock him, they blindfold him and play a, a grim game of blind man's buff. Um, they would blindfold him and then they'd strike him and say, prophesy, who is it that, that struck you? And they did other many things against him and blasphemed him. Then he's taken into this second official trial. The elders of the people are there and the chief priests and the scribes are there. Um, if you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. Notice they ask, and three different titles are used here. They ask him if he's the Christ, and he says, and he doesn't say, for very good reason, I think. If he said, yes, I'm the Christ, then for the Romans, that's an executable offense, but, but more importantly, their idea of the Christ is wrong, just like we've seen in the disciples. They can use the right word, but they got the wrong idea. And if he and for him to say, for him to say, yes, I'm the Christ, would be true, but they wouldn't understand it in a true way. They wouldn't know what he was talking about. And if he said, no, I'm not the Christ, I'm not your Christ, I'm not the Christ you have in mind that would be to deny, I mean, he really was the Christ, only he redefined what it meant. So Christ is used, but he changes, he changes the discussion by saying, but from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So what he's, so what he's saying is, I'm the Son of Man, and I'm going to be right up there with, with the Heavenly Father. Um, so they asked, so then are you the son of God? And again, whatever he says is not going to be understood. And yet there's another thing too. They're not going to believe it. 
It doesn't matter if he says he's the Christ. They don't, they're not going to believe that. If he says he's the son of man, they don't believe that. He, can, he uses the term, I think, because it's, it's a little less of a loaded term for them. They probably don't know what to do with it, really. Uh, and, and son of God, if he says he's the son of God, they're not really going to understand that. And underlying all of it is they just don't believe. Um, so when they say, are you the son of God, then he says, he says, you say that I am, you, you said it, but that is a little short of his saying, it, you see, he's, he's put the ball in their court. They don't believe it, but they've said it. And then they say, what further testimony do we need? We've heard from ourselves, we've heard it from your own lips. So you're condemned by your own words. And that ends the Jewish trials. In the next chapter, we will, he'll be uh, taken to the Pilate and then Herod and back to Pilate again before the crucifixion and resurrection. So we're coming down to the end. We've just got two chapters left. We will not be meeting next week because of Thanksgiving. So we'll be meeting in two weeks. And for those of you who are doing the final exam, you should, should have already received that. It was sent out. You should have already received the final exam. And that's that will be due on the last day of class, which will be December 1st, and in which we'll finish those final two chapters. So let's... Um, Let's close with a prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are deeply thankful to you for all that you've given us. We thank you for this beautiful world in which you've placed us. We thank you for family, for friends, for brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you for all the spiritual blessings that you have given us. And most of all, we thank you for Jesus, that he was willing to endure what he endured for us, that his life and his death and his resurrection make all the difference in our lives. Father, help us to live in a way that brings honor and glory to Jesus and help us each day to understand him. And because of that, you better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good night, Jim, and have a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. You have a happy Thanksgiving, too. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank, happy thank Thanksgiving. you. Happy Thanksgiving. Bye. Bye. Jim, it just gets richer and richer. <laughs> uh, I had to take a phone call. Was anything said about the... Uh, uh sweat like great drops of blood no um i was going to say something about that but i just didn't just didn't get it said um uh i will you know since we're still talking i'll say how i take it people take it in different ways i think it probably probably means that that the drops were not necessarily that they were red, but that they were uh, drops like like he had really been slashed and uh, like drops of blood coming out of him. That the the that the drops of sweat were that that size. Yeah, that I think the the Greek word. I looked up the Greek word. I don't know why I was studying this the other day, but it just comes to mind now. But the the Greek word in the text is like. And um, I've offended some people, I guess, and, you know, it's sort of like a, a sacred cow or something. But I, I knew that several years ago when I was in a class and I said, no, it wasn't blood. And it wasn't even, it was like the specific Greek word is, a, is, a, is a added to the text. And uh, I would say that, that it was not blood but they have a term for it. There's a Greek, there's a term for it from, uh, let's see, thromboi. Thromboi is the Greek word, like 
drops or clots, in other words, but it well, I don't believe it was blood. I think the blood shedding of the blood was was in the scourging and in the crucifixion. Yeah. Well, you know, and people have gone into all kinds of lengths to say to explain how how there could be blood mixed with the with the sweat. Um, and I just I, I think that's unnecessary to have to come up with any explanation like that. It's to yeah. say I think it's what it's saying is he was sweating profusely. Right. It was like as you said, if if he had been bleeding, that that would be the size of the of the drops that are coming out of him. Well, I'm, I'm I could I thought about getting my Greek text and finding that like word, but it specifically does not mean the same as. It is like. Yeah. And it's it suggests I think clearly enough that it was not blood, but it was like great. So, but there are just some people, I bless their hearts. You know, I had some people get mad at me <laughs> in a Bible class and I didn't mean to offend them or anything like that. It just, <laughs> that's just what the text says, you know? Well, how can you say that? I have always heard. Yeah. Yeah. One time we were in a discussion with a former teacher of mine and some of us young bucks were disagreeing with something he said how audacious yeah but his final argument was i've heard this preached for the last 40 years and yeah disagreeing yeah with it. yeah and, so, and it's like what i thought to myself i just couldn't i couldn't say it right him, but what i thought was if any of us used that argument you'd pound us yeah yeah that that absolutely. absolutely but there are a lot of people who think that even though they don't say it i've heard this for 20 years i've heard this for 30 years whatever yeah and it's got to be how can you be how can you be disagreeing with it <laughs> one time one time i was preaching it i was living in north fort worth and i had the contribution before the the unleavened bread and fruit of the vine i separated it and had it before and and not in the same uh, trio, you know, they were separated, yeah. but it actually didn't even separate after I put it before. And this woman comes up to me after, after services that Sunday. And she said, I have been a Christian now for 50 years and we have never done it that way. And, <laughs> and another lady came up and said, this is the first time in my whole life. I feel like I'm not paying for the Lord's supper. <laughs> <laughs> I had I had to laugh. I I was trying to be very serious, but I just still had to laugh when she said that. But it's it's a wonderful study, Jim. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you for contributing to it, and thank you for the encouragement. Uh, did you get the book? I meant to ask you. Oh yes, I meant to. Well, no, I thought I mentioned that. Yeah, well, thank you. But you may have, but I may have missed it. And Last well, week. and I thank you too for the. Yeah. For the devotional guide on prayer yeah yeah, yeah we've, we've enjoyed that and uh we had a very generous guy from arkansas basically uh support that and um so we're we're really thrilled about it they're going to translate it into spanish uh, a brother in fort worth is going to translate it into spanish and uh, we put part of that guy's money in getting those books to the spanish preachers over in florida who will go to Central America and places like that, and even to Africa. So I'm thrilled. It's that, a great that's blessing. exciting. God, God, God just blessed me. I have to share my share my blessing. Uh, well, I got, got another phone call, and, and the son from Arkansas is coming in tomorrow. So I will hang the phone up. Okay. <laughs> Good Love night. You, and thank you again. You Excellent lesson. Thank you. Good night. Good night.